In this segment, we will go over a summary of corporate finance. Let's start with capital budgeting. First, some general remarks. Capital budgeting is the process that companies use to decide which projects to do and which projects not to do. So simplistically, this is the process. Generate ideas. So what are all the possible projects that can be done? Analyze the various proposals and projects. Then do your planning and capital budgeting, which means deciding on the particular projects to do. And then the projects that you are doing, you need to monitor. And then post audit means that after the project, you do a review as to whether it went as you expected or not. These are the different kinds of project categories. Either you can have a replacement project where you are replacing a piece of equipment, for example, or an expansion project, or new products and services, or mandatory projects. All this is fairly common sense. This segment is very important. A key element of capital budgeting is deciding or estimating the cash flows for a given project. Because as you'll see later, to decide whether or not to do a project, you look at the cash flows and then discount back the cash flows. So obviously, you need an estimate for the cash flows. And these are the principles that you need to keep in mind when you consider cash flows. You need to consider incremental cash flows. What this means is that if you are doing a replacement project, for example, you have a machine M and you are replacing this machine with another machine M2. What you need to look at is the incremental costs. So if you will sell this and get a salvage value and this costs more money, it's the incremental or the differential amount that you consider. And then every year you say that because of this project, what is the incremental cash flow? That's the first point. Consider timing. Obviously, we need to worry about time value of money. So $100 after one year is very different from $100 after three years. So when you do your cash flows, you also need to know when the cash flow is coming. Simplistically, what we do is we aggregate cash flows in a given period and then show those cash flows at the end of the period. Consider opportunity costs. So if you are using your own facility for which you are not paying rent explicitly, but you could rent that out for a hundred dollars, then this hundred dollars needs to be part of your cash flow. It needs to be considered as a cost. Consider externalities, both positive and negative. If because of your project, there is a benefit to some other project in the company, then that benefit needs to be considered. If there is a negative externality, such as cannibalism, where because of your project, another part of the business will suffer, then that negative externality also needs to be considered. Obviously, you need to worry about cash flows on an after tax basis. In red, I'm showing you the items that you should not consider. Any sunk costs should not be considered in the decision making process. And also you should not consider finance costs. The reason for this is when you project your cash flow, that cash flow is going to be discounted at weighted average cost of capital and the finance cost is already built into VAC. Some other fundamental terminology, conventional versus non-conventional cash flow. Conventional cash flow means that you have an expense initially and after that money comes in. So there is one change in sign. Non-conventional means that you have more than one change in sign. Independent versus mutually exclusive projects. An independent project is a project where you decide whether or not to do that project on a one-off basis. So you don't compare that project with other projects. With mutually exclusive projects, if you have two projects A and B which are mutually exclusive, then it makes sense to only do one. Project sequencing means that at times you want to do a project first and then another project after that and so on. Unlimited funds versus capital rationing. Very, very occasionally a company might have a lot of funds, so it will then do all projects that have a positive NPV. But the more realistic scenario is where there is a capital budget or a capital ration where companies know that they have a certain amount of budget and they need to decide the best projects to do within that budget. This is the most important concept in my opinion. 
in this reading, the net present value and then related to NPV is profitably and related to NPV is profitability index. NPV is the present value of the future after tax cash flows minus the investment outlay. Now, in most textbooks, you will see this expressed as a formula. So it will be minus cash flow times zero, and then you'll see a summation sign, or there will be other forms of expressing this. But I am not a big fan of trying to remember that formula. Just understand the concept. NPV means that you have a negative cash flow initially, that's your cost. And then you also consider the present value of all future cash flows. And if you have a cash flow like this, then what I really want you to be doing is using the calculator. So make sure you do this enough times that it is second nature. Once you find the NPV, what do you do? If the project is independent, then accept projects with a positive NPV. This is called the NPV rule. For mutually exclusive projects, select the project with the highest NPV. This is the point that made that is made towards the end of the reading, but since it's related to NPV, I brought it up front. NPV is a direct measure of the expected change in firm value from undertaking a capital project. A positive NPV project should cause a proportionate increase in a company's stock. So if we take a very simple example, where the NPV from a project is 100, and let's say that this company has 50 shares, just picking easy numbers, then because of this positive NPV, the per share price will go up by 100 over 50, which is 2. So this positive NPV is distributed across the 50 shares. Related to NPV is the profitability index, which is simply the present value of a project's future cash flows divided by the initial investment. If the profitability index is greater than one, then you should go for the project. So having a positive NPV is the same as saying that the profitability index is greater than one. Next, IRR. IRR measures the return for a given project. IRR is the discount rate that makes the present value of the future cash flows equal to the investment outlay. We can also say that IRR is the discount rate which makes NPV equal to zero. So these are different definitions that you need to be aware of. I like to give a very simple example where if you have an investment of 100 and then the project has a cash flow of 110 after one year, then the discount rate which will make the present value of 110 equal to 100 is 10%. So 10% is the IRR. And note through the simple example that 10% is also the return of the project. This is called internal because you have generated that 10% numbers purely based on this cash flow. It's not based on anything else. The IRR decision rule is that if the IRR is greater than the required rate of return, then you accept the project. If you are doing mutually exclusive projects, then the IRR rule will be to accept the project with the highest IRR. If you have numbers like this, then I do not want you to write the NPV formula. What I want you to do is calculate the IRR based on the cal using the calculator. These are some other metrics that are used to evaluate projects. The payback period is the number of years it takes to recover the initial cost of the investment. The advantages of this method are that it's easy to use, easy to explain, and an indicator of project profitability. Drawbacks are and an indicator of project liquidity. It tells you how easily and how quickly you get your money back. Drawbacks are that this does not consider cash flows after the payback period. You might have a certain project that takes a while to get your money back, but then gives you a lot of money after that. Payback period will not tell you that. It also does not consider the time value of money and does not consider the risk of a project. A slightly better method is the discounted payback method. This uses the present value of the estimated cash flows. It gives the number of years to recover the initial investment in present value terms. Advantage is that it's easy to use, easy to explain, and an indicator of liquidity. So the, more or less the same advantages as the regular payback method. The drawbacks are that it does not consider cash flows after the payback period. 
it does consider time value of money and in a sense it does consider riskiness because it says that if the project is more risky then the discount rate will be higher. But note that the main advantage of both these methods is that it gives you an indication of project liquidity. How quickly will you get your money back? But both these methods are poor measures of profitability. It is possible that a project gets you your money back fast, but it's not very profitable. Is it possible to have a project with a short payback period, relatively speaking, and have a negative NPV? The answer is yes. So if you invest 100 and get your money back, let's say $101 after one year, this is a one-year payback, but if the discount rate is 10%, then this is obviously a negative NPV project. This final metric, which I don't think is overly important, but for completeness we are covering it, is the average accounting rate of return. Here, for a given project, you figure out the average net income over a particular period, and then divide by the average book value over that period. NPV profile. The NPV profile shows a project's NPV graphed as a function of various discount rates. So NPV is plotted on the y-axis, discount rate on the x-axis. Here I have shown you the NPV profiles for two projects, project blue and project red. Point A is where project blue's NPV profile intersects the y-axis. This represents the sum of the undiscounted cash flows for Project Blue. This point B represents the discount rate such that the NPV is zero. So this is the IRR of Project B. Then you have Project Red, and Project Red and B intersect at this point. That is called the crossover point. Crossover point is the rate at which the NPVs of both projects are the same. Now, if you are to decide between the two projects, let's say that they are mutually exclusive, then according to the IRR rule, the red project is always better. So IRR says that, look, the red project has a higher IRR, so go for that. But what does NPV say? NPV says that select the project based on higher NPV. If you have a discount rate that is less than X, let's say X is 10%, that's the point where the two projects cross over. If the discount rate that is relevant for these projects is 6%, then the NPV rule will say go for project blue. So there is a conflict here between what IRR and NPV say. If the discount rate is 12%, then the NPV rule will say go for project red. So to the right of the crossover, the NPV rule and the IRR rule say the same thing. Okay, now speaking of conflicts between NPV and IRR, if you just have one project and you are deciding with whether to do that project or not, so then NPV and IRR will always tell you the same thing. There will not be a conflict. So if the NPV is positive, then automatically the IRR will be greater than the cost of capital. On the other hand, if you have two projects, so now you have two projects which are independent. For independent projects with conventional cash flows, generally there will be no conflict between NPV and IRR. Now again, these are independent. So if two projects are independent, then you select based on IRR or NPV, you will get the same answer. But what if they are mutually exclusive? If they are mutually exclusive, then it is possible that there is a conflict between NPV and IRR. And the two reasons for the conflict have to do with different cash flow patterns and different scale. So if you do one project which is on a small scale, you maybe invest 100 and then you get 120. So IRR will tell you that the return is 20% versus you do another project on a much larger scale. You invest a thousand and from thousand you get 1050. So the NPV is 50 and the NPV rule will tell you to go for the larger project. But in terms of a return, 
it will be lower. So you can have a conflict between NPV and IRR either because of different cash flow patterns or different scales. And the regular lecture goes into more details related to these differences. You need to understand the difference and similarities between NPV and IRR. The advantages of NPV are that it is a direct measure of the expected increase in the value of a firm. And if we talk about the goal of management, and if we talk about the fact that the goal of management is to maximize shareholder value, then this is theoretically the best method. The disadvantage of NPV is that it gives you a number. It says that, okay, NPV is equal to 75, but it does not consider the size of a project. You can have a, a $10 billion investment with a 75 NPV, or you can have a $100 investment with a 75 NPV. So the 75 NPV doesn't tell you much about the scale or size of the project. IRR shows the return on each dollar invested. So it gives you a sense for the return. And then you can compare the return with whatever your required rate of return is. The disadvantage is that IRR incorrectly assumes that money is reinvested at the IRR rate. So this is a very testable point, just remember it at this stage. There might be a conflict between IRR and NPV, and if there is a conflict, then go with NPV. It is possible that you get multiple IRRs or no IRRs for a project. This can happen if you have a non-standard, non-conventional cash flow.